Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along today. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces, but it's also very gratifying to see a lot of new faces. Um, we've been working on developing this uh, ISCF Challenge Programme for quite some time. Uh, many people in the room have, have helped us by submitting ideas, thoughts, suggestions, and um, just sort of on a personal note, I'm utterly thrilled to be standing in front of you today launching this competition, which is the first real significant part of SSPP. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to the call, uh, uh, but focusing really on the, the, the scope, uh, you know, the types of projects that we want to support, some of the basic information to help you understand how to frame your projects, what we're looking for, and um, um, some, some, some advice and guidance on, we, we're doing things a little bit differently for people that have applied for Innovate Funding competitions before. There's a couple of extra questions. Uh, so trying to broach that subject, talk about that. And just to reiterate right at the start, uh, members of the SSPP team and the KTN team will be here all over the day. So please, if you've got questions some time later, but do find us during the course of the day. We're very happy to discuss this. So let's start off. So um, I like to start these things with a couple of uh, just sort of scene setting slides. So this is my first one. Uh, this is a picture that I only sort of saw recently. Um, that's a plastiglomerate. Has everyone heard of those? Show of hands, audience participation. Oh, OK. So that was found in Hawaii. Um, that's actually, uh, you know, possibly people are referring to them as what will the, the fossil record of the Anthropocene or as some people call it the Plasticine show. And it's possibly things like that. That's lumps and nodules that are found now on beaches, uh, in the sea. And it's a kind of fusion of polymer material and uh, aggregates and gravel and sand. You know, plastic is so ingrained into society that we're now ingraining it into the earth. And it's that challenge facing up to the responsibility of how we balance the enormous potential and benefits that plastic brings with the consequences of not looking after it particularly carefully at the end of its life so far that led to the creation of this challenge. But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, always go with a positive one. This is another one that I saw recently. Um, plus it's space, it's awesome. This is the Made in Space Recycler. So this is a concept project um, going up to the International Space Station. So uh, a while ago, they got 3D printing capability. So the idea is that you know, as, as tasks and things get more and more complicated up in space on the ISS, you've got to have that particular shape spanner that works in a certain way, um, or any number of other tools or potential spare parts. You can either have a huge inventory of stuff, or perhaps you can make these things up there. So 3D printing offered that opportunity, uh, but very heartened to see that they've now evolved that concept. So this is actually a system that lets you take that spanner after you've whittled that space nut. There's a phrase I never thought I would say. Um, you can chuck it back into this and actually recycle the material back so it can be printed into new products. So it can be done. If we can do it in space, um, hopefully we can do more and we can do better down here. And Plastic's been around for a while. That's uh, some sort of early stages. The goal of cellophane, one of the first plastics used in plastic packaging. Um, but it's important for us to note that, and it, very important for us to, to, to sort of establish from the get-go, that this challenge, this program, is not anti-plastic. We're very much in favor of plastic. We very much recognize the important role that it plays in society, the provision of food, the provision of healthcare, the provision of other products, the provision of um, you know, surgical procedures, everything. Um, it's, as a material, its benefits are enormous. The challenge, of course, is that we don't value it sufficiently at the end of life. And we need to innovate and we need to change the way we do things because this is where we're ending up. This is the uh, surfaces of the plastic-free communities. Whole communities signing up to say, we won't use any plastic. Uh, and I think if we can collectively work together to innovate better solutions, we can hopefully turn the tide of this and continue to enjoy all the benefits, the enormous benefits that plastic bring, bring, bring to us, but avoid some of those 
uh, unfortunate and unforeseen side effects and costs. So, Innovate UK, the research councils, we're all part of a, of a larger entity called UK Research and Innovation. And we've been doing an enormous amount of work in plastics research for quite some time. Um, this was our attempt to sort of summarize the various projects and innovations that we funded. Um, you know, you've got everything from chemical recycling technologies to photonics-led projects looking at improving optical sorters, all sorts of work on the bio and biotech side of things, from compostable formats of packaging to utilizing enzymatic and microbe approaches to breaking down biological recycling to new types of joining chemistry. But this is the first time that a fully integrated, I think, um, joined up program has been developed, which encompasses most of what you see up there, harnessing it towards achieving a goal of creating a more circular economy for plastics in the UK. So the Smart Sustainable Plastic Packaging Program is part of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Funds, and its goal is to establish the UK as a leading innovator in the delivery, use, design, manufacture, and recovery and repurposing or recycling at end of life for plastic packaging in consumer products. It's part of the overall uh, industrial strategy clean growth targets. And what we want to see, uh, or what we're all looking to work towards, is a dramatic reduction in plastic entering the environment um, by 2025. Because it's an industrial strategy challenge fund program, it has a number of underlying objectives that are very important to note, because these are the things that you know, will shape the decisions we make with regard to which projects are funded. The first is the ISCF as a whole has a target to unlock a significant overall increase in research and innovation spend across the UK. So the current government's target is 2.4% of GDP being spent on um, uh, R&I. And that's a, a, a sort of co-investment between public money and private money. GDP is something over four trillion, I think, so can't work that out, but that's a lot of R&I we need to spend. Apparently, somewhere at the moment, we're somewhere around about sort of 1.3, 1.4, so there's a lot of push. So ISCF is to unlock greater levels of industry co-investment. Specifically, we, we want to deliver research innovation to support more sustainable plastic packaging, and because in the UK, an existing set of sort of industry and government and general stakeholder agreed targets existed, rather than develop our own, SSPP has adopted or works to support the targets of the UK Plastics Pact. Uh, and lastly, one of the key elements around Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund is, is you had to make the case for why you needed this coordinated single point of work. And as we were scoping this out in the very early stages, one of the things, the messages that we heard time and time and time again is there are lots of great ideas out there, but what possibly is lacking is support to ensure that these individual innovations form part of a cohesive whole, that we move towards delivering systemic change. We have to change the entirety of the plastic system in order to avoid the unfortunate consequences you see on the bottom right. So the challenge program itself um, is divided into three, and there's 60 million pounds available for us to spend. We'll be spending approximately two million pounds on a core program. So that's directly investing into driving that collaborative change. We've got eight million pounds earmarked for enabling research. So that's research that we imagine being primarily delivered, well, almost entirely delivered, by academics. You know, there are lots and lots of things that are still at that, uh, uh, or gaps in our understanding and knowledge, if you like, that are still at that stage where they're perhaps best explored in the context of academia. And my colleague Sarah will be talking a little bit about the Enabling Research Programme later on. And we're really hoping that most of the people here are, uh, represent businesses, that you'll find ways to help shape that programme and participate in that programme. So the research that comes out can act as a foundation for subsequent innovation. But the lion's share of the funds are earmarked for what we call dynamic R&D, and the demonstrators today are the first uh, release of funds to the market. Um, most of you, I hope, would be familiar with generally how we work with providing funding. You know, it's match funding, state aid compliant, 
specifically to support research innovation activity. So as I said, the core program is up, it's running. I want to flag up the UK Circular Plastics Network, um, ukcpn.co.uk. That's an initiative to ensure that whatever we do, all the activity that we cover, whether it's a networking event or a workshop or pitch training or an enormous round of demonstrator funding, that's a place where you will be able to access all the relevant information, find links to events, invitations, contact people for support. On the right there, that's a, a, one of the first networking events that we co-organized with RAP, focused on reuse. That was up in Birmingham a few weeks ago. Lots of fun. You know, when it comes to the enabling research, as I said, things primarily delivered by academics. Um, these are just a couple of examples. Some work that we funded with UCLs just started on the big compost experiment. Fascinating citizen science uh, program where they're actually asking people to see how packaging that their soul that's given to them or sold to them as compostable, whether it's the thing that wraps around a magazine or a takeaway food container, um, actually put it into their compost bin, make some notations, make some results, log all that information. That's a really rich source of data, which of course, as it's academia, will end up being published and available for us all to use in our thinking. On the right, other work as well, quite fascinating around, you know, what might the next, next iteration of recycling technologies look like, uh, particularly biological recycling? So the identification of microorganisms and enzymes that can very rapidly break down polymers and possibly stitch them back together again. Who knows where we'll be? But this is what I think most of you are here in the room today. Uh, this is the, the sort of the R&D program funding. And we're working right the way from early stage feasibility studies to the late stage demonstrator, first of a kind commercial demonstrator projects which is the funding that we're launching today. So, um, it's my one attempt at humor today. Um, the demonstrator program. Often with Innovate, um, we, we're very good at funding up to kind of like TRL, you know TRL 6, 7. So stuff's working, you can demonstrate it, maybe you've built a little pilot rig. It's harder to get funding for those big implementations the real sort of commercial scale or potentially commercial scale pilot examples of technologies or, or processes or even business models. And that's a real problem because if you want these things to be investable, you have to be able to show that they work. And particularly, uh, I personally bear the scars and I know several other people in the room do, when it comes to investing in plastics recycling, um, a lot of, of, of technologies, a lot of businesses, particularly in the UK, have not done well over the past few years. Um, I worked at a, a recycling company called Closed Loop Recycling. We were very novel, we were very innovative. We were one of the first companies to do food grade recycling for polyethylene. Um, but uh, again, as many people will know, that business no longer exists. Fortunately, it's been integrated into uh, a waste company, Veolia, and they're actually now running that facility uh, managing to do it. But that, we think, is what, what a lot of investors see if someone says, oh, I've got an idea, it's plastics. It's like, ah, mm, mm, mm. There you go, second attempt at humour. So the demonstrator programme is about helping bridge that gap. And that message came across really clearly in the early stages of the scoping for this. We've got to be able to support um, real-world implementations of this technology. You've got to be able to prove that your thing, your kit, your process or your business model works in the real world where people are kicking it or, or you know, a, a recycling process that, that works if you, you know, you've got to be extracting real material, processing it in real world conditions. So we go into the, the sort of specific details of the scope of the call. So first few points around the fact your, what your project, your project must aim to Make the plastic supply chain more circular. Must deliver that kind of circular economy outcome. Your, your project must be able to sort of like explain how, if it was successful and delivered at scale, it would deliver the targets of the UK Plastics Pact. I will go through those on the next slide. I'm sure most people know them. But also for demonstrators, it's got to show how it would improve on current state-of-the-art plastic packaging and demonstrate that it's sort of practical and close to market solutions. If, you know, there will be more funding 
in next year for earlier stage ideas. These demonstrators are for stuff that is close, maybe just needs that final bits of information and trialing at scale to really nail it down. In parallel today, we're also running a smaller side competition, um, but no less important, which is small amounts of seed funding specifically to develop full-scale proposals for later rounds of demonstrator funding. Uh, you know, the project there, you must aim to effectively develop a proposal for the next rounds of demonstrator funding, which will take place six, seven months into next calendar year. So that's what your project must do. But your proposal will need to spell out in detail how your project supports the objectives of the pact and aims to deliver systemic change and also clearly explain how you would reduce the overall environmental impact of the UK plastic packaging chain. And this is new. This is not part of our standard assessment process. So just to cover off the pack targets for people that aren't aware of them, there are four headline pack targets. By 2025, we want 100% of plastic packaging to be reusable, recyclable, or compostable. 70% of plastic packaging to be effectively recycled or composted. 30% average recycled content across all plastic packaging. And uh, the pact aim is to take actions to uh, eliminate problematic or unnecessary single-use packaging items via a variety of ways of doing it. So all projects will need to be able to show us, and we will be assessing on the basis of how they say that they will be able to help the UK meet those pact targets. There are four main areas that we're expecting to see, four main themes. So um, one of those is materials innovation. So that could be new recyclable polymer materials. It could be work in biopolymers. Um, it might be a program or a project that related to compatibilization, i.e. making it easier to use recycled content. Um, that could be through the use of additives, um, compatibilizers. It could equally be through um, different blend rates or processing conditions, lots of different ways that you can push up the quantity of recycled content. It might, who knows, be a way that you can actually um, mask, if you like, what are currently perceived to be negative effects of using recycled content in packaging. Um, again, to hark back to the time when I was um, recycling in anger, uh, we used to struggle enormously with the fact that the, the recycled HDPE we were trying to sell back into the dairy food chain uh, was too green. And the reason it was green is that we drink more semi-skimmed milk than any other variety of milk. So when you come to little cat flakes and ink coming off labels, there's more green ink than anything else. So our pellets ended up slightly too green. If we were all super healthy and drank skimmed milk, I imagine they would have been slightly pink. But that's not the case. Um, but also at the bottom as well, alternatives to plastics for packaging. So uh, that you might recognize, uh, they're Ohos, Uhus, uh, by a company called Nopla, um, where that's a, an innovation that's edible, Pouches of ketchup, I don't advise eating the whole pouch of ketchup. Um, their mojito ones are much nicer. But it, you know, replacing um, uh, sachets there and uh, partnering with Just Eat, which again, you know, so even though that's a project that's funded, it's funded under a previous competition, you can start to see, I hope, some of the elements there. That's a materials innovation. Um, they were working out how they could produce these things at scale, but they were integrating with the end customer. So they were demonstrating and learning how, instead of just inventing a thing, um, they were working out how that new thing fitted into the supply chain and understanding the barriers to uptake by uh, restaurants and consumers. Some of the consumer feedback comments were quite entertaining, I have to say. Ooh. That's good to know. Um, theme two, design innovation. Um, so that could be changing the design of some design for recyclability, design for reuse, um, making food delivery and other delivery packaging more recyclable. Um, could be smart marking or identification technologies to make sorting easier, or potentially reduce the overall volume of packaging through sort of smart online delivery systems, although that crosses over a little bit. Um, with the business model innovation. There's no, for what it's worth, I'm sure some projects will fit neatly into one theme. Most many will have elements across the four themes. Again, uh, the product there, not one that we funded, but we are now working with the same company. Um, that's a reusable tampon applicator. 
And, and that was a design-led exercise. How can we design out what is currently a single-use product, uh, um, disposable tampon applicators? That's doing very well. So those kinds of approaches. At a demonstrator level, I think what you'd be looking at really is to perhaps test a new design, not necessarily develop one, but because you know, these things only work if you've got extensive market feedback. Otherwise, you, you run the risk of, I don't know, what's a famous design failure? Ah, perfect. I had one well, 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 years ago. Don't worry. Anyway, um, theme three, technology innovation. Uh, this is where we anticipate a lot of the applications are likely to come. Uh, you know, technology up and down throughout the chain. Reuse processes. Um, could be technology related to improving collection. Technology related to improving sorting and separation. Might be mechanical recycling. Could be chemical recycling. Um, could be anaerobic digestion or composting, as long as it related to the uh, digestion or composting of packaging. A demonstrator project for, for sort of a, a novel AD process would not be in scope unless that project's aim was specifically to facilitate the inclusion and processing of compostable packaging. Uh, again, uh, a project that we're only just getting going but funded by us, that's a, a, a project looking at near-infrared cameras. Classically near-infrared cameras, not very good at seeing black plastic. Um, lots and lots of work has gone into shifting things out of black. But there's a lot of resistance there because black is a very useful color to use in the recycling industry because when you do end up with jazz product, it's easy to get a consistent black. The company, this project is, is revisiting um, the fundamental principles of, of how near-infrared cameras are made, shifting around which bits of the spectrum that the, the, the chips look at, and actually potentially could generate enough data for a system that could identify black materials. Um, early stage, but uh, just an example. And last, by no means least, business model innovation. And particularly, we're, we're expecting reusable packaging systems such as refill, zero packaging business models and systems, uh, and consumer or business behavioral change related projects. How can you demonstrate how these things work? So. As with most competitions, we have a few things that we have ruled out of scope. Out of scope in this context means that um, we will not consider projects that meet or we judge to meet these three criteria. So any project that doesn't have plastic packaging as the primary focus. So a recycling technology that was very clearly predicated, let's say, towards automotive or we plastics, a little line saying, but you could chuck bottles into it as well, is likely not going to fly. We certainly won't ex support any projects that encourage or facilitate the export of plastic packaging while still classified as waste. Meaning, if intrinsic to your business model is the export of low-grade material, this is not the funding stream for you. This is about developing solutions that we can implement in the UK. And lastly, if your project involves the use of manufacture of either a liquid or a solid fuel, so that might be RDF, or SRF, or if it's only converting plastic into fuel, that we're also judging out of scope for this competition. But, and I want to stress this, um, this is just for the sake of this program, based on how it's been created and the thinking and the stakeholder engagement we did. Uh, projects in all of those areas, including things like plastics to fuel, um, you know, there are open funding mechanisms that you can still look at and still consider. So the, the link there will take you to our page, smart funding, always open. So a few of the quick headline details. For the demonstrator proposals in round one, we have up to 12 million pounds to invest. Uh, because this is late stage commercial demonstrators and also because of the importance of driving up private investment towards that 2.4% of GDP target, we are offering 25% funding of eligible project cost. This is lower than many of the mechanisms and competitions that you will be familiar with. What we are saying, though, is that that grant is at the project level. As these projects need to be collaborative, if you have the right mix of partners, um, all of whom must be meaningfully contributing and investing, uh, uh, for example, an SME could claim more than 25% of their costs, but there would need to be an effective balancing across the, the overall project pot. Project values, nominally, 2 million up to 48 million, uh, unless agreed separately. Um, and if you sort of work that out, you realize that, we hope my math is right, 
This could lead to one demonstrator project. It, it could be a grant of up and around the 12 million pound mark if it's a sufficiently large project. You can have up to three years to undertake the project. They have to be collaborative. They must be business led and involve at least one SME. Um, and also, uh, projects must meet the state aid definition of experimental development, which I'll cover on the next slide. For proposals, we're investing up to 700,000. That's in total, that's not at an individual project level. Um, it's a standard funding model. So for these small projects, um, you know, if you're an SME, you can get up to 70% of your eligible costs, that sort of thing. It can be single company or collaborative. In, for this, we can, you can lead an application into the proposal round if you're an RTO, a research and technology organization, but you will need to be collaborating with a business that's somewhere in it. And these are short, these are sharp things. You'll have about three months to do it. Um, they have to be a feasibility study and the output should be ready to be entered into subsequent rounds of demonstrator funding. So just to talk very quickly about experimental development, um, for the big demonstrator projects, you know, this experimental development is, is the kind of the latest stage of permitted state aid research. So it can comprise prototyping, but demonstrating, piloting, testing, test, testing, sorry, testing and validation of new stuff, but in those real life operating conditions, you know, you're really about this is how we make it work at scale. <clears throat> This can include the development of a commercially usable prototype or pilot. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't necessarily the, what a final plant would look like, but often people think, I can't build, I have to build something half size. No, you know, think it through, think carefully. What, what do you need? How do you get the best out of this demonstration project? But the last point is also important. Doesn't include routine or periodic changes made to existing things. It does have to be novel. It does have to be innovative. Okay, just now I'm going to turn very quickly to the extra questions. So most people, uh, anyone who's covered Innovate funding before, will know we as standard ask 10 questions. And one of those questions is um, question six, which asks about the wider impacts of your project. And in that we ask you to tell us a little bit about what the environmental, the social, the, the wider economic impacts that your project might deliver. We've kind of pulled back from that approach enormously. It's absolutely intrinsic to the SSPP program that it's coordinated and consistently shows how the, the sum must be greater than its parts. So we need projects to tell us how they are considering delivering systemic change, how they are meeting the PAC targets, and to tell us a lot more information than usual about the environmental outcome, be that impacts of their project. So we are introducing question three. First point to note, highlighted in yellow. Most of the questions are marked out of 10 as usual. This question and question four, which is about the environmental stuff, is weighted higher. Again, this underscores the importance of us judging a lot on the basis of your answers to these questions. We really need you to convince us that this project fits the overall strategy objectives. So it's marked out of 15. So we're asking you to take a, a systems perspective to explain how this project can deliver um, the PAC targets and systemic changes. And things that you might want to include, we want you to understand which elements of the supply chain you will be considering as part of your project. Um, what, what are the boundaries of your activity? Are they wide enough? Are you considering enough? Not developing solutions in isolation. How would your project lead to a change in the system? Are you changing consumer behavior? Are you increasing a recycling rate? Are you reducing the use of virgin plastic, perhaps through design, or perhaps through greater inclusion of recycled plastic, or perhaps by innovating a way towards a zero packaging model, something like that. And specifically, specifically, how you would meet which of the four pack targets, it could be one, could be two, could be three, it could even be four, but we really want to see some information about how you would contribute towards us achieving the PAC targets. And on question four, environmental benefits. Note again, this question is weighted higher than the others. So there are 15 marks available here, not just 10. <clears throat> again, taking that systems perspective, what we want to understand is the positive and negative environmental impacts of what this project will deliver. 
Positive and negative, because we recognize that there might well be trade-offs. If you use more plastic to create a pack, but then you reuse that pack a dozen times, or 116 times in the case of a cotton shopping bag, as we learned the other week, um, you, know, you accept that there's likely to be a higher environmental cost in the individual creation of that piece of packaging, but that's offset and the positive benefits outweigh it. We're asking people to take a life cycle approach, um, and that includes considering things like additives or chemicals or glues or inks that you might be utilizing. And when you structure the answer, um, there's kind of, I suppose, two components to it. So the first one is that first bullet point at the bottom. Tell us how this project will prevent or reduce plastic escaping into the environment. Maybe it's by increasing collection rates. Maybe it's by eliminating the packaging. Then tell us about the direct and indirect carbon footprint impacts of your project compared to the current state of the art. Uh, and that includes both any additional logistics that might be involved, things like the production of carbon dioxide if you're sw perhaps switching over to a, an approach that involves biodegradation, if applicable. Then once you've covered off how do you stop plastic getting into the environment and what's the carbon footprinting aspects of it, the last three points are related to if no matter what you do, something did get out, what would the impact of that be? So are there any consequences, likely consequences of human exposure, plastics, uh, likely consequences to other species, natural environment, and then finally, in a sort of catch-all, any other environmental impacts not covered by the above categories. Um, we also are asking that if you are looking at using biomaterials, bio-derived materials, that you consider and tell us a little bit about the impact on land use, particularly around the displacement of food crops. Now, if you have a life cycle analysis, you can and we would urge you to submit it. Um, we're allowing quite a lot of additional information for these two questions above and beyond our standard, academic, uh, standard application process. But we are not stipulating that you must have an LCA. I just want to make that very clear. Certainly, though, you would anticipate that that kind of life cycle analysis thinking uh, would really help our assessors and us understand what the potential impacts are and help us to judge the project. So I'm just going to finish now um, with a, a, a quick note. Um, so this is a bit of a... But um, one of the things, again, that came out as we were, we were building out the ideas for this project is uh, there's a lot of questions around end of waste, and particularly there's a lot of questions at how... Um, what are the legalities of moving plastic waste around? So we've engaged directly with the Environment Agency and they actually sent over this information for us just to mention here briefly. So in particular, pivotal is the definition of waste. At what point does stuff become waste? Because that's when you start to have to have waste handling licenses, starts to be where you have to have special conditions on your, any facility that you're building, starts to impact on or couriers and, and transport companies that you can use. They need to be licensed. So uh, the Environment Agency asked us to highlight that they run a definition of waste service. Um, it's voluntary, but it is pay to use. But the outcome of that is a national opinion applicable across England as to whether or not that material is waste. Um, they have a tool, an online tool called Is It Waste? Um, and uh, you as a, as a company or as a project could, could utilize that services. There's a, uh, an email address there, which um, I, I, I don't know, these, I assume these slides will be made available. There you go, you dig into it and find it. Yeah, I'm getting thumbs. So do, do engage because we work with a lot of projects uh, and it, you know, it comes up a lot in the workshops and the scoping workshops we've done. People are like, oh, the environment agency won't let us do this. Ask them, engage with them. Um, they're aware of this project, they're aware of this proposal. And again, through us and through KTM, we can make direct connections if you've got any questions related to that. And they also, they asked me to do this slide as well, um, which I understand because we just spent ages telling you what makes a good submission. It's only fair that the Environment Agency gets to do the same thing. So, um, you know, what they say is if you do want to use that tool, um, there's a, please complete the definition of a checklist. It's on the Is It Waste tool. Uh, provide proper data, um, sample data, comparative evidence underlined. Uh, I like the fact that they're asking you to tell a clear story about your waste derived material, why it should be considered end of waste. Um, and particularly about that one at the bottom, it satisfies the three limbs of that end of waste test. Distinct and marketable, used in the same way, 
and with no worse environmental human health impact than the non-waste it replaces. Non-waste it replaces. The virgin material it supplies. Anyway, so just a final point. Any concerns or queries about that? And um, do engage with the Environment Agency. You know, one of the things that our assessors will be looking for in proposals is a clear understanding of the various and relevant waste regulations that a project needs to adhere to. Right, at this point, I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Izzy from the competitions team, who's going to run through the important stuff. Thank you. Um, OK, I'm just going to go through IFS and everything else with it. If you've used IFS before, I do apologise, but do bear with me. Um, so this competition allows resubmission, resubmissions. Um, so you can use a um, application you may have put into IFS previously for a different competition. Um, the eligibility criteria. So Nick did go through a few of these. So for the feasibility studies round, um, we say that the lead must be a UK registered business or an RTA. You must carry out your project in the UK, exploit the results from and in the UK, and um, basically academic institutions cannot lead on this round. The project cost is between 25 to 50,000, um, and that's the total project cost. Um, your projects must start by the 1st of June 2020 and finish by the 31st of August 2020, so they can last up to three months. And um, also, if we come around to the demonstrators, so the lead again must be a UK registered business. Um, it must be collaborative, involve at least one UK SME, again carry the work, uh, the project, carry out the project, sorry, in the UK, exploit the results from or in the UK, and again, ac academic institutions cannot lead. Uh, this round, the project costs are between two and 48 million. Again, your project must start by the 1st of April, this time 2021, and end by the 31st of March 2024, and it can last between 12 and 36 months. So the types of organisations that we fund include business, so small, micro, medium or large. This is all done by the EU definition, which if you wanted to see which one you come under, uh, there is a link there for you to check. Um, we also fund research organisations, including universities, non-profit um, RTAs, including catapults, public sector research establishments and research council institutes, and public sector organisations and charities doing research activity. Um, do bear in mind that if you are 100% owned by a large parent company as a small subsidiary, this means that by EU rules you are classed as a large company, and you will only be entitled to the relevant grant. So um, Innovate UK offers funding under the General Block Exemption Regulation. This is available to all eligible UK businesses, but we cannot grant funding to companies that um, meet the condition known as undertakings and difficulty. This is for any company, um, limited liability company, that's over three years old. Um, and it's where more than half of a company's subscribed share capital has disappeared as a result of accumulated losses. And again, if you have a parent company, uh, the test can be performed on them. So as we said, uh, this competition comes under State Aid Article 25, which means it must be either feasibility, industrial research, or experimental development. As Nick mentioned before, um, these come under feasibility studies or experimental development, depending on which stream you're going to apply to. So basically, the aim of the State Aid scheme is to optimise level of funding to business and to recognise the importance of research-based projects. Uh, at least 70% of total eligible project costs must be incurred by business, which therefore means the maximum level of... Um, project costs that can go to a research organisation is 30%. So um, for a collaboration, the uh, collaborative project, sorry, there must be at least two organisations claiming grant within the application, which includes a lead, um, a business or an RTO-led consortium, uh, which may both, in, oh, words, which may involve both business and research base and evidence of effective collaboration. Um, so we'd expect to see the structure and rationale of the collaboration described in the application form. If you are successful and this moves forward, this will have to be done as a collaboration agreement. So just some basic um, things we have. If you make more than one application, so any business can be involved in up to three applications to this competition, but can only be the lead partner in one. Any one research and technology organisation, um, they can't actually, they can't lead. No, RTOs can, I lie. RTOs can lead it, but only in one application, and there must be at least two other UK businesses claiming grant. Um, there it is. If they're leading an application, they may be involved in up to three applications to this um, competition, 
and where I got confused is a research and technology organisation. Uh, they cannot lead, but they can be a partner in any number of applications. Um, so this is just to say that if you have any um, finished Innovate UK projects that you are still outstanding a final claim or an independent accountant report, um, you will not be able to receive funding in the future until these reports are in. Um, if you applied for a previous competition as a lead or a sole company and were awarded funding, and then we decided that you did not make substantial effort with that reward um, and to exploit it, again, you will not be available, uh, you'll not be able to claim any more funding. So for the both streams of this competition, the timelines are that it will open on Monday. Um, the briefing events, obviously today. The close date is the 19th of February, 2020. Please bear in mind that this is at 12 on midday. Um, IFS will automatically close at this time, so do not leave it until 11.59. Um, chances are you won't get through. Um, the demonstrator round does have interviews. These will be in the week commencing the 13th of April. And the, for both rounds again, the applicants will be notified from the 24th of April. IFS itself. So um, if you haven't used it before, um, you can just go onto the website, search for the competition that you're after, and then go ahead to create an account. Um, you can, if you're a UK-based business, you can use Companies House Lookup as it speeds up our checks by providing uh, your company number and you're unable to enter it at a later date. So this is really important for us, especially with our UID checks. Uh, for research organisations and academics, we say that you enter your information manually just to make sure that you're not accidentally listed as a business on IFS. This will make sure that you can uh, claim the correct amount of funding. So uh, project details. Here we're going to ask you about your application team, including the collaborators, which will be to invite the organisations who you want to work with on the project, and contributors to invite colleagues from your own organisation to help you complete your application. Um, included here is in the application details is the title, timescales, what research category you're coming under, um, innovation area, and whether or not it's a resubmission. Your project summary, we ask you to pop in a short summary um, stating the objectives of the project and what's in innovative about it. Public description um, is a description of your project that you will be happy to see published should you be successful. And scope, we're asking you to tell us how your project does align with the scope of this competition. So the questions for the feasibility round um, include the need or challenge, approach and innovation, system changes in UK plastic packed targets, environmental benefits, commercial case, including the market awareness, commercial viability, team and resources, uh, wider economic and social impacts, project management, risks, added value, and costs and value for money. Um, as you can see on this round, questions two, four, seven, nine, and 10, all have got an appendice that you can use. Do please bear in mind some of them are you can use, some of them are you must use. IFS will state all of this um, there, so it should be perfectly clear. Um, for the demonstrated rounds, We've got need or challenge. We've got the same questions, but this time you can have an appendice on questions one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, 10, and 11. Um, so there's a lot more information there should you wish to add it. When it comes to your application finances, uh, to claim funding, your business does not have to be UK registered with Companies House when you apply, but it must be registered before you can receive any funding. And you are unable to cl <laughs> claim grant funding um, if you're an overseas organization uh, with the company number beginning with FC or BR or JE. Uh, when it comes to your labour costs, so there are certain eligible and non-eligible um, amounts, the eligible including staff working directly on the project. They must be paid by PAYE um, and includes your national insurance, pension and non-discretionary costs. Um, the ineligible costs include your dividends, bonuses and non-productive time. Um, overheads, again, IFS does have all this written down, so it should be a lot easier um, when you're seeing it on the screen. Um, so overhead, our definition is additional costs and operational expenses incurred directly as a result of the project. So these can include additional costs for administrative staff, general IT, rent and utility. Um, indirect overheads. Um, administration, sorry, so please ensure that they are additional and directly attributable to the delivery of the project. And direct overheads can include office utilities, IT infrastructure, laptop provision, not covered by capital usage. Um, again, attributable to the project and provide a detailed breakdown together with um, methodology and basis of apportionment. We do have a project finance team that will go through all this should you be successful. Um, so the more information you put up now, the easier it will be later. 
Uh, so the material costs, we ask that you are clear on what the materials are. So just putting in consumables doesn't provide enough detail. And again, we, you will be requested for more information. Um, capital equipment usage, eligible is using the project or shared with day-to-day -day production. Calculations will need to be in line with your accounting practices. And even if the equipment is depreciated fully over the life of the project, this must be added under capital equipment. So the use of subcontractors, um, we want them to be justified and quantified. If using a non-UK subcontractor, um, you'll need to provide strong justification as to why a UK-based one was not being used. And if you're subcontracting to a parent or sister company, please ensure you list at cost and do not include profit. When it comes to travel and substance, costs again must be directly linked to the project. Uh, the breakdown in your travel bit is travel, accommodation and substance. Um, if you have an annual trip to visit the parent company, this is not eligible, nor is going first class. Um, other costs, so eligible is costs that could not be added under previous headings. Do not double count and patent filling costs, patent filling costs even for new IP. Um, for SMEs, this is limited to seven and a half thousand um, pound. So funding, uh, the level of funding awarded will depend upon the type of organization, type of research being undertaken in the project. Uh, funding is calculated by project participant. IFS will advise a maximum grant percentage you can request based upon your answers to the type and size of your organization. The research category defined by the lead applicant in the application details section of the applicant. Um, this is just an example. You do not have to match this. It's just an idea of what can be done. And again, IFS will tell you whether or not this breakdown of costs could even work for you. Um, but yeah, it's just something to bear in mind, especially as the research base cannot exceed 30%. So when it comes to your academic partners, we ask that you use the JES forms. Um, they're automated and they collect the full economic costs for us, um, to which you're entitled to 100% of the FEC. Um, where am I? Also collect project finance details from the non-HEIs. For example, RTOs that are claiming they are carrying out academic quality work and want to be funded on an FEC basis. And using JES means Innovate UK follows the standard Research Council guidelines on funding universities and it enables research councils to easily co-fund Innovate UK projects. Um, so when you fill out from the uh, JES form onto IFS, there's a section there where you can fill everything in. Um, so you enter the reference number contribution and then we also ask that you do upload the JES form with accounts with um, with the with council status um, form as a PDF on the bottom of the screen. So JES applicant el uh, elements, not just financials, so the justification of resources, pathways to impact and the full details are on the JES system. Unfortunately, as you can probably tell, I won't be able to help you at all should you have a question for your JES, but they will. Uh, when it comes to submitting your application, just know that um, every organisation on your um, consortium will be able to see the project cost summary. They cannot see a breakdown of your costs, but they will see the overall. Um, so here, the, so to say, on the summary, do ensure that the highlighted costs um, fits the criteria for this competition, and all the organisations, as I said, can see it. But you will have a much further detailed thing, as will your assessors. Um, so do check the appliances are complete. IFS will let you know if they're not. And at the lead, you'll be able to see whether or not anyone else in your consortium has yet to um, finish out and complete their finances. So we ask that you submit your application early. This is a little sheet of the lead up to the midday um, close time. IFS is not perfect. It's well on its way, but it's not there yet. And if you have issues at the last minute, do let us know as soon as possible. We'll do what we can for you. Um, but we do also check to see whether or not you're actually online and trying to submit at the time. Um, so just a quick view through the assessment process. Um, so all of the applications are going to be assessed by independent assessors drawn from both industry and academia. And what they are looking for is clear and concise answers, the right amount of information, uh, quantification and justification, and a proposal that presents a viable opportunity for growth, a level of innovation that necessitates public sector investment, has the right team and approach to be successful. Um, so a quick note on this, the feedback is compiled using written comments of the independent assessors who review and assess the applications. It is intended to be constructive in nature and to highlight both the strong as well as the weak areas of your application. So please bear in mind that because applicant applications are assessed by a number of assessors, you may receive information which appears to be conflicting. Uh, this may reflect their different interpretations of the proposal. 
Um, it must also be noted that some proposals may appear to have been favourably assessed based on the comments, and in such instances, it could be that the proposal simply fell below the funding threshold. Upside, you can use their comments to improve and maybe apply next time. So uh, scoring, we review scores and feedback that the uh, assessors give to us to make sure that they are adhering to our guidelines and scoring fairly. In some cases where we feel a score is unjust and not supported by the feedback, we may remove that score as an outlier, um, which could then change the total score of your application. This could go either up or down. Um, so please be aware that both line, low and high outliers are removed. So a quick screenshot. Um, this is one application's no, it's not. It's an entire set of applications and the spread from the assessors that we received. Um, anything over 30, we would look into to make sure that there's not an outlier between all their comments. Um, and on the count of no on scope and the count of no received uh, columns, if they've got three or more, you're automatically ineligible because um, it's normally out of five. So we do make it odds, but fair. This is now a breakdown of a single question. Um, again, it's not. It's a single application. Um, so the green box is a particular assessor's score on an application. Uh, the purple box is a set of scores for a particular question. And the red box, as you can see, would appear at first glance to be an outlier. So here we'd, we would look into the, um, that particular assessor's comments and make sure that their scoring is backed up. Um, so the assessor feedback will be available to you on IFS at the end. Um, and I, the lead, sorry, will be notifi notified by IFS when it is available. Uh, for the interviews for the demonstrator stream, if you're invited to an interview, you can bring up to three people to attend. Um, you have got 20 minutes to present a maximum of 20 PowerPoint slides. Please, no videos or embedded links. Um, there is also going to be a 30-minute Q&A session led by members of the panel. And the response to feedback, presentations, and presenters' names have to be provided ahead of the interview. You will be chased for that if that's necessary. And just in case you are successful... <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Um, IFS for successful applicants, you've got eight steps to complete. Um, it's applicable to all the grant claiming partners. Uh, some of it must be completed within 30 days. The rest of it must be completed in 90 days or funding could be withdrawn. Um, we're going to ask you to confirm your bank account to make sure that we are paying the correct people. Um, and if you have any issues and want to change anything within your project, we're going to ask that you hold off on that until the project has started. Um, so just a quick one. As project setup, all grant claiming project partners will be required to complete. Um, so just to avoid any delays, please know who your project manager will be, who will be the finance contact for each consortium member, and how your consortium will be set up, if that's applicable to you. And collaboration agreements. These take an awful long time sometimes. Um, the original agreement must be signed by all participants. We cannot have any input into this. Um, it's between yourselves, um, but some key features do include who's in the consortium, what are the aims and how the work is divided up, the ownership of the IPR and management of the consortium. Yeah, again, if you can start work on that sooner, that would be the later. Brilliant. Just a quick thing to bear in mind that grant claims and payments, they are made um, quarterly in arrears. Um, clock claims can only be made for costs incurred and paid between the project start and end dates, and claims must be subject to independent audit, depending um, and according to grant size. Claims are only paid once quarterly reporting and necessary audits are complete, and projects over six months are monitored on a quarterly basis, including visits from the appointed monitoring officer. Anything outside of this will be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis, and the monitoring will be carried out against detailed project plan and financial report. Yeah. Right. Um, if you have any queries that don't come to you right now, do feel free to come uh, get hold of us and support. The people at customer service will probably put you through to me um, initially, and I'll quickly pass you on to the relevant person. Um, any other information you might need, you've got the key to, uh, KTM website or even ours. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Easy as well. We've got now, sorry, Nick, Easy. do you want to say something? Easy, stay, stay. Come on. So we've got about 15, 20 minutes for, uh, for questions. So uh, any questions, anyone? If you could say who you are, who you represent today, that will be helpful. Uh, yes, sir? Yes, please. Yeah. 
Hello. So my, uh, my name's Chris. I'm from a um, design consultancy called Reboot Innovation. I have a question I think is chiefly for Nick. Um, hello, Nick. Um, my question is about um, is about the smart part of the um, of this program. So obviously, when um, if you'd have mentioned the word smart to me before, I would have thought technology and RFID tags. Um, but obviously, this call feels like it's a little bit more orientated towards the, the sustainability parts of of plastic. So where, 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 if at all, does the smart bit come into, into this uh, funding competition? Now, I, I hope you don't perceive this as a weasel answer, Chris, but I think that's up for you to tell us. I mean, we, we are stipulating that um, smart packaging is in scope, but it must be smart and sustainable. So, you do, you know, smart and sustainable. So, if you wanted to integrate tracking systems, RFIDs, any of those kinds of technologies, um, it comes to that fact where there might be positive or negative impacts. So the inclusion of a tiny little super light RFID tag might potentially negatively impact on the overall recyclability of a pack. But if that facilitated a change in con consumer behavior that led to a particular piece of packaging being reused multiple times, then that is where I would see an offset. You know, it's the overall impact if that was implemented at scale. Likewise, I mean, in, in terms of smart packaging, you've got kind of packaging again that enhances um, packaging capabilities. So uh, a packaging format that potentially allowed for extending shelf life or better indication of the quality of the contents of the piece of packaging uh, could potentially lead to less packaging being wasted because you would keep it longer. Uh, and so um, you, you would see lower amounts of plastic generated. So it, it's there, it's in scope, but we, you, we certainly don't specify that things have to be smart. I mean, don't, don't, I, I personally wouldn't advocate sticking RFID tags unless there's, there's a positive outcome. Is that... Okay, thank you. Um, hi, uh, Alex at Community University in Nottingham. Um, I'm sure you'll get this complaint from uh, a lot of people, but the 25% the maximum grant, um, obviously we've seen that's sort of the direction that Innovate UK are going in, you know, obviously trying to get more bang for your buck. I sort of understand the argument for reducing that from your point of view. My question is, you know, are you worried that that will dissuade non large businesses, SMEs, universities, local authorities, et cetera, from, because they would typically get a larger share of the grant. Large companies for experimental development, if I'm right, get 25% anyway, so that's sort of normal for them for experimental development, but for other partners, either it would have to push up the 75% to much higher for large companies to sort of cross-subsidize, or other companies, you know, universities, we have to take the 100% you know, are, are you worried that that will dissuade other companies from, from you know, participating? Um, uh, it certainly is a concern, yeah. Um, as we, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to be very explicit about this, is the fact that this is not the standard funding rates that we would be offering for projects of this kind. This is part and parcel of the overall goals and aspirations of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund as a whole. Um, the conditions for this competition are the conditions for this competition. But the one thing I would hope is that we are a learning organisation and we will be looking very carefully at the uh, entry rates into this competition. We will be looking very carefully at how projects are trying to divide up the available funds that they can get. Uh, and we, we also, you know, we have one of the things that we've been able to do within the SSPP programme is uh, uh, identify and lock in uh, some funding f uh, specifically for academic-led proposals where this 25% mm. won't count. So under the Enabling Research Programme, it will be business funding as usual. We were able to do that as well for the, um, the feasibility studies for writing proposals. Um, but when it comes to the large-scale demonstrators, and uh, again, in the interest of transparency, although, as I've said, we are, we are paying attention, we are, learn, we are learning from this. 
we are getting some feedback like that from other ISCF challenges. Um, we'll, we'll just have to see and revise and revisit as much as we can. So, so just very quick follow on the, the feasibility studies, which is a round one for presumably a round two demonstrators. Do those demonstrators have the same 25%? So it, it, is that the expectation? At the moment, if you like, written into the plan, they do. But that's not confirmed. It won't be confirmed until those competition details go live on IFS. You know, so, um, you know, we are, we are trying to be as responsive as we can, whilst at the same time working towards the aspiration for the fund and the increase in private sector investment. Thank you. We had another question over here. Um, so, Matt from Catapult. I attended one of the earlier briefings in Birmingham about the funding level for RTOs and universities was 75%. Is it now back to what the original standards were of 100%? So, I don't... So, the thresholds that an individual organisation can take, yeah. right, are those mandated in state aid. Mm -hmm. That 25% cap is at the project value. But as a colleague at the back pointed out, yeah. For an experimental development project and a large business, their maximum ceiling is 25% anyway. So it's not quite that point. It's the, for the RTO involvement, I understand the, 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 the cap, that's fine. For, sorry, costs was my question. Is it 100% of eligible costs that the RTOs can claim? And yes, providing the things sort of ping together yeah. and it hits that overall project threshold. Mm -hmm. But of course, you'll need to agree that within the consortium. And I do, I, you know, not going to hide the fact, and I recognise this adds work to having to do it. And again, one of the reasons for the, uh, you know, the proposal grants to help write proposals in part will facilitate the time, energy and effort that needs to go into building and agreeing a consortium that can work within the financial constraints. One more question. Yes, my name is Egido D'Antona from Quantum Ambils. My question is about the envir environment agency requirement for uh, not to be classified as waste anymore. And uh, the second requirement, you say that has to be used in the same way. Uh, is this about basically has to be, if it's uh, the polymer, let's uh, say a polymer or the plastic was a packaging, needs to be used as a packaging again, uh, necessarily? So I I might, I'm going to suggest that you address that question to the environment. Okay. Agency. Because um, what, what we require for any, um, any project in any area is that all project participants comply with all relevant law, legislation, um, uh, licensing yeah, requirements, I, uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah. The point about the environment agency is just as we were developing the parameters for this program, one of the common points of feedback that came from the various workshops that we ran was that sometimes confusion about end of waste legislation, how it might apply to a pro on a project basis and how it might apply to a technology or business model or process if ultimately employed at scale was a barrier to innovation. People worried about whether or not the environment agency would let them do something. Okay. So that's why we engage with the environment agency and they say, hey, Mac and said, just point people to us, ask, ask us, we're happy to help. So, so basically, if there is a reason to consider this, if it, you know, it's uh, actually positive, as a positive outcome, this, uh, mm, this point could be discussed. It's not uh, set in stone. It's a kind of guideline. In terms of, the environment agency's definition. Yes. No, that's very, that's set out. Ah, okay. Yeah, so you need to engage with them. You, you need to make the case, as it were, if, if you so choose to do. Uh, hi, Dan Garland. Um, I work for Hain Daniels, a food producer. Um, I may already know the answer to this question, but we're obviously facing retailers and, and into the consumers, and there's a big push against the use of plastic. So for me to go into the business and fight for us to, to work on a project to better use plastic is a big challenge. Is, have you got any thoughts or comments around how we can turn the, the consumer tide and therefore the retail tide and things like that? Um, <laughs> um, so I respect the experiences that you've had. Um, I mean, that's not accorded with us. Weaving, weaving however, I'll, I'll, let me clarify that point in a minute. 
Certainly, we've had representatives from all the major supermarkets, many of the major brands, some of whom are probably hopefully in this room, talking about how they want to work towards better outcomes for plastic, more circular plastics, more sustainable plastics. Some of those aspirations are built into use less, um, whether that's through light weighting or reusable systems or so on and so forth. There's a whole wide range of strategies. But based on my observation, the appetite to innovate in this area is quite high. I do accept that um, by nature, people that come to the workshops that we run are always, yeah, let's do it. It's not always that easy. Uh, it's always been a challenge to effect change. Um, and that's, again, one of the reasons why we are actively encouraging and wanting to understand how you are working collaboratively, how you are trying to bring along all the different players to make sure that solutions that are developed, technologies that are tested, are practical and work within the wider context of commercial reality. Does that make sense? And, and again, through, through dint of, um, you know, via KTN and, and the UK Circular Plastics Network, um, we can help try to introduce you to maybe the right people within retailers. Perhaps, you know, a lot of packaging manufacturers will necessarily deal with a buying team and, and you know, where decision making in that area is not necessarily in their job description or their bonus requirements but perhaps widening out the conversation to people like sustainability managers. And if we can help connect you to the right people, we're happy to try to do so. Hi, sorry, it's Ellie Stam here from Sustainable Ventures. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but I was just wondering, our, our ventures are probably more, and this is an area they struggle with, with that sort of technology demonstration stage, which isn't quite the full-scale demonstration ones that these are, but they're way above sort of a feasibility level. Is there an opportunity in the future of a funding round which would help them develop those connections and do a, do a competition in that area, in the middle? Um, okay, so two things. Firstly, um, projects don't have to be £48 million pounds in size. They can, they can be £2 million. I appreciate, though, that that's still pretty big um, for this particular demonstrator round. Um, but the answer to the, the second part is yes. And in fact, and I appreciate somewhat confusingly, we have got a, a competition that we're hoping will go live in mid-January, which we're also calling feasibility studies. Although uh, in terms of state aid definition, that'll probably cover what we, you would think of as a feasibility study or a piece of industrial research. I've lost the, I've lost the room now. But yeah, earlier stage stuff, smaller projects. And then we anticipate... Um, around about towards the second half of next calendar year, where we will have at least one additional round of demonstrators. In the plan is two additional rounds of demonstrators, but also a large block of the more classic CR&D funding, which would be very much for that, you know, I think what you're describing. Yeah. So just bear with us. We're okay. working that through. Um, one of the reasons that we've run, we've gone quite quickly into this demonstrator project funding is, again, as we were developing the challenge, uh, we are aware that there are a number of projects out there that are ready to go. And in order to give them the maximum amount of time, because we're time limited on a challenge fund program, we, we've moved as quickly as we can to this first round of demonstrator funding. Over the course of the first six to seven months of next year, through UKCPN, we'll be doing loads of collaboration building, trying to help really good project ideas come up. Most of the money will be made, will be made available July, August-ish of next year, or at least that's the plan. Thank you. John Williams from Granted Consultancy. Um, just a question really, it's following on from your point there. With respect to the feasibility competition that you're running now for the demonstrators, you mentioned in the competition notes that there's then a, you basically an it give you access to an invitation only competition. Is that what you were just referring to in terms of that stage one, yes. in terms of that piece? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, the goal is that the, 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 those proposals that we fund will go into a ring-fenced um, round of demonstrator funding. But that's not all the demonstrator funding that remains. 
So the will, the the intention is to have at least one more round of open to all funding. And it, what, and it, you know, and if and if, for example, they were to open simultaneously, you might say, you know, people from the proposals competition go there, everyone else go there. Yeah. So the twenty percent cap on demonstrators is for the twenty five. 25, sorry, 25% 25 cap on total project funding. Do, can you include other f uh, forms of funding, say like regional, so like council funding, can you bring that into the project uh, so long as state aids are not breached? I, I mean, is he, do you want to have a go? I mean, <laughs> so I would suggest um, that's a question that we should probably come back with a formal answer rather than me speculate now. I want to speculate, but I won't. Uh, but I, I, I take that as understood, that, that that's, a, that's a, a question that needs, needs answering. Sorry, it's a very um, t um, specific funding question. Just um, I'm starting to uh, sort of understand what other competitions you have in, in the pipeline. And... Um, Forgive me if I've got this, I've got this wrong and, and in a muddle, but I just want to be clear that if you have... So uh, um, forthcoming demonstrators will have a 25% cap, or that, that's currently planned, but the alternative or parallel collaborative R&D, can you, can you give us an idea of whether they'll also have a similar sort of 25% cap? Is that a sort of policy decision now um, or... Is that going to go back to a more traditional, so, um, um, yeah. traditional cap? And until the competition details go up on IFS, subject to change. But on that basis, the current plan is that for CR and D, we would be able to offer forty percent of project cost, with the same the same proviso or, or factor that that's total project cost, forty percent of cost recoverable. Okay. And and again to reiterate. This is, this is new for us experimenting in this area. Having to work to those kind of leverage targets, um, we are watching very closely what's happening to, you know, for every competition we're, we're asked to suggest what we think the level of application will be. And, um, you know, when we've got hard data about how long that long bar is at the bottom of the submission deadlines, so after 10 o'clock, um, that's really when we'll be able to understand and gauge what's going on. Okay, and we have one last question. Um, hi, my name is Monica from Plastic Energy. Um, I have a question regarding the LCA. Um, you said that you are urging to submit an LCA, so I'm just wondering to which level the LCA has to be performed. Is it a critically reviewed, or could it be just a general industry one? Or so we're, we're not putting requirements... We're not saying you have to give us an LCA. If you've got one, use it. If you've got time to undertake one and you want to add it to your application, great. But we're not going to specify whether or not it has to be sort of critically reviewed or the, because, um, you know, it, it depends. Some projects, particularly bigger projects, probably have got very detailed, um, possibly quite expensive life cycle assessments or analyses that have been carried out by professionals on their behalf. Some organizations will have the capability to do that internally. Other organizations, particularly in some cases SMEs, might not. So, you know, we will be taking, uh, you know, as balanced a view as possible, but as much information as you have available is what we're looking for. And as an indicator, what is the most important indicator? Is it CO2 emission or circularity or...? So we're not, we're not specifying that any one thing is more important than any other thing. It's a, it's a holistic whole across the application. You know, when we talk about, uh, you know, the answer to the PACs and system change and the environmental impact change targets are weighted higher um, because we're very, very, very keen to ensure that the program as a whole achieves in those areas because that's what my and my team and the overall organization's uh, objectives are for running this program. But it would be wrong not to think that, you know, that if I have good answers for those two, I'll swing it. You won't. You need to be scoring, I would say, highly across all 13 or all 12 questions, depending on which competition you're going into. 
Hello, it's Chris Radway from Circulonomy Limited. Um, most of the emphasis of the um, Challenge Fund does seem to be the sort of technical side of things, including design. But could you just confirm for me that projects such as uh, behaviour change are not excluded? I presume that um, behaviour change of, of consumers to help them to understand, to improve their recycling behaviour, for example, could be included and would probably be what, under the business model innova uh, innovation uh, strand? Would that so, be right? um, yes, they would certainly be considered. But again, you need, you need that firm and strong answer across the whole piece. So things like market opportunity, jobs, growth, employment, increases in individual company productivity. This is, this is still a competition that is being run through Innovate UK. And, um, you know, so changing consumer behavior in respect to a sort of in, within a commercial operation I would think, yeah, absolutely. Some of the wider consumer behavior change, more difficult in effect to, to work out how, where the economic growth comes from. But it, it, it can be done, and if it can be done, yeah, definitely in scope. All right, thanks, Nick. Uh, hi there, George Melton, Void Technologies. Um, obviously, the focus here is on circularity and improving circularity of plastic packaging. Um, for kind of innovations where we are cir you know, circular and recyclable, but the focus is more on light weighting. Is that still a kind of a focus for this competition? So one of the things that we haven't done is have what we, what we would sometimes call highlight themes. Mm -hmm. So you won't find saying we're particularly interested. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as you're somewhere on them, you know, the scope is very broad for this competition, very broad. You know, if it's a materials innovation, I mean, I prefer the term, and because not least because Sally will glare at me if I don't uh, right weighting rather than necessarily mm -hmm. light weighting. Take that out with Sally if you want to discuss it over the break. But, but you know, yeah, again, you have to keep coming back to this thing. It's got to be a holistic whole. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just about, um, it's obviously, you know, the most points are available by telling or will be available on how we assess the extent to which you could meet the pack targets. You know, if you were... Um, uh, you, you know, light weighting, there are questions, uh, valid questions, about whether or not that impacts on the recyclability. You know, direct experience as a bottle recycler from years ago, that wafer thin bottles, not particularly conducive to recycling, they used to clog up the air classifiers, spent many happy hours poking it with sticks to get stuff out. But equally, and, and again, I, I have purely speculatively, you know, a project where you were looking at light weighting, but perhaps you were working with a recycler to ensure that a light weighted product would not adversely impact recycling rates or would be more recyclable, that I, sus I suspect would probably do better in the assessment process. Great, thanks. Again, this is probably my lack of understanding rather than anything else. But um, in terms of collaboration and subcontractors, um, you're, the, the purpose is trying to encourage collaboration. But um, if a subcontractor may want to be a subcontractor rather than a collaborator because they may be able to get a better return on, 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 on their costs associated with the project. If you, we are trying to encourage collaboration, where is the incentive for that collaboration? Because I, I can't see it. And it may be my lack of understanding no, on it. Interesting. Trying to find so, um, for state aid, we, we, we're looking for what we would term meaningful collaboration. Yep. Uh, in some cases, uh, but we, we recognize and subcontracting is an eligible cost. Yep. Yeah. But, an application where you had, um, and we do see applications where you do get companies who say, oh, well, I, you know, I'm going to do this as a subcontractor because I, that effectively as a subcontractor means I get fully paid. So the project bears the cost. The flip side there is I wouldn't expect a subcontractor to get any share of IP. I wouldn't expect a subcontractor to get any share of licensing. I wouldn't expect the subcontractor to do anything other than sort of quite highly specialized tasks where the expertise is not available to the main collaborators. I mean, the, 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 in part, the way we encourage collaboration is bluntly by making it mandatory. But, yeah. you know, you would hope that the best and most 
sort of sort of worthwhile, um, meaningful collaboration comes together. Plus, you know, subcontractors, as I said, need to be paid in full. So yeah. you know, if you can't use them because you'd run out of money, you know, those are decisions that the projects have to make. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Sylvie from Philosophy. Um, I'm here representing two SMEs, one large company, one academic and one CIC, which would be a collaboration. Um, what I can see from this is that there are there is one demonstrator project and one research piece that we would be interested. And they are intrinsic, because it's a systemic solution, we're, they're intrinsically linked. Um, but they would obviously have to go in as two applications, but they are fundamentally linked to each other. Um, is the scoring system going to enable you to see both together because it really is systemic? It's a holistic solution. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Projects will be assessed independently. Okay. Um, are you talking, are you, do you mean two projects that might apply into demonstrator or one that might apply into no, demonstrator one, and one into proposals? One is a demonstrator yeah. with a very realistic solution for um, plastic packaging, recycling. Okay. Um, as a result of that, there is a piece of, of uh, a PhD with Plymouth University for academic um, social impact measurement directly as a result of what's happening with that. So one is, an R, is a research proposal um, which is uh, linked to the, the project for the demonstrator. I'll explain separately. Sure. Okay. <laughs> but there, it's two that um, benefit each other and they provide a ho whole solution, um, which is what you said you were looking for at the, at the beginning. So, okay. Yeah. Well, okay. you know what? Happy to talk about that. Okay, thanks. Well, if there are no more questions for now. Please, let's say thank you to, uh, to Nick and Isi for now. Thank you. And then hand it over to Brian McCarthy from the KTN, who is going to be talking about uh, uh, how KTN can help. So I'm going to begin by uh, just saying that I'm delighted by how many people have attended today. Um, I think we're all on a journey and we're all on a bit of a learning curve. If I was to ask, I think, across the piece um, where you are on that particular journey, it would be quite uh, various in terms of the, the responses. Um, I begin with a, uh, a, a, a clear uh, declaration. This event is being recorded. It will be available. The slides will be distributed. And maybe I should point out the most important slide I have is probably the last one, which has got my contact details on. Uh, Veronica's explained we will be around this afternoon, uh, Sally and I and Veronica, to talk about individual projects. But I really just want to spend just a couple of minutes explaining what the KTN is um, and ideally how we can help. And maybe I could keep it very short and say, please read the questions. Um, it really is as simple as that. The fact that you're here today tells me that you're interested in maybe applying for funding. Um, and that's great um, because Innovate UK and UCRI are just as keen for you to apply. And it's basically trying to arrange for that meeting of minds. Part of our role is to help you to come up with the best proposal. Um, we don't help you write the proposal, but we do help you uh, review the proposal before you press that button and actually submit. So our role is really to help you to understand really what Innovate UK are looking for and to try and help you basically craft the answers to the questions as skillfully as you can. But what, we, what do we do? We, we're, we're trying to help organizations to innovate. Uh, in this space, we're talking about smart, sustainable plastic packaging, and we're trying to increase the GDP of the UK. That's it. That's what we're trying to, to do. Um, we're going to try and help you find the right sort of expertise. So in the room, we have a number of industrial companies, large and small. We have a number of universities. Some of you will know each other. A number of you will not. 
part of our role is to make those introductions. You may have a great idea. You may not know what the market is for that idea. We can help you to understand what the potential market is for that idea. We can introduce you to other people who can actually guide you and maybe partner with you in terms of moving along this journey to actually secure some funding to enable you to explore that idea and actually take it to the marketplace. Finding funding. So this is one particular competition. Um, <laughs> clearly you're interested in this area, but there are other opportunities out there as well. Um, I will mention innovation loans as, as an option from, from Innovate UK, but also others maybe in a startup position. You may be looking for uh, venture capital funding. And again, we can, we can help there. But the KTN's role is, is really about connecting people. Um, and it depends where you are on your journey. Um, if you have a, uh, an idea, you have a concept, maybe not fully refined yet as a project. Um, maybe again, I should signpost you to our innovation canvas, uh, which you can download from the, the KTN website. Um, and it's also available online just to help you along to try and convert that idea into a project. And then we can actually introduce you to the various competitions of which this is one, and actually then guide you to answering the questions. And please, just to emphasize what Izzy was saying, please don't leave it to the last day before you press the button and submit your answers. Uh, it just doesn't, doesn't help. Um, I do recall over the, the last uh, week or so actually saying to a, a client that their answer to question three of an Innovate UK competition was absolutely world, world beating. It was absolutely incredible, but it was actually answering question five. Um, so you really do need to read the question, answer that particular question, and also maybe take a little bit of guidance uh, in terms of in terms of answering, um, everything we do is free. Everything we do for you is confidential. Um, we can help uh, introduce you to collaboration agreements. We can signpost you to universities. We can do a whole range of different things, but everything we do is strictly confidential. And there's our website. Um, we are funded by Innovate UK and they are a key and leading partner for us. Um, Innovate basically invest our money, our taxpayers' money, to generate a return and to increase UK GDP. But also um, they enable us to advise you on where to access information. So I'm just going to mention very, very briefly, look at these websites. Uh, Gateway to Research is a great, great and invaluable uh, website. Look at CONFA and also look at the general information available under ISCF, of which this is one area. Um, but that general information also, maybe I should mention, if you Google uh, Innovate UK Project Database, this is updated on a monthly basis, you can see every single Innovate UK funded project, and you can see what has been funded previously and who the various players are. But I mentioned the, the general advice, um, the broader picture, uh, if you want to look at other competitions, uh, the regular smart competition is, is now available, uh, just look on this particular website as well. Everything is now online, which I think is a great, uh, a great uh, way forward. I think one thing I should stress, purely reflected in the number of questions that have been asked already this morning, is that um, we're trying to basically push the boundary a little with this particular competition. So Nick has said clearly there are some areas where he cannot answer 
uh, it's a learning curve for everybody. And please have a degree of patience with us all, but we're trying to, to actually deliver a really worthwhile competition here. Okay, uh, I've mentioned the uh, Innovate UK funded projects. Uh, please have a look at that. Um, and the, um, the ISCF competition. So please just look, instead of just focus specifically on this particular competition, just look at the ISCF thinking. And that I think will guide your, uh, your, your, your broader appreciation as to where I think you Korea is trying to, to, to guide us. Okay. But it's about smart, sustainable plastic packaging. And this whole area is, is not going to disappear. It's, it's here, it's on our agenda now. And it's something that we really need to address uh, both in terms of the UK and, and globally. Uh, Sally is here to talk about uh, UK uh, Circular Plastics Network, uh, I'm sure. Um, and I'm just going to quickly go through these, but interested in novel polymers, novel designs, novel recycling processes. Uh, in the couple of seconds I've got left, I will plug MRE 2020, uh, which will take place across the way in, uh, in Islington in February of, uh, of next year. And it's bringing together the, uh, the community, the research community, um, in the materials area uh, under one roof. Um, and the, the dates the 19th and 20th of, uh, of February. Um, so just to complete, uh, I said the final slide would be uh, my contact details. So I know we have uh, this afternoon available for individual one-on-one -on -one consultations, but I'm going to draw it to a close and pass you back to Veronica. Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so Brian is just shortly going to bring up a slide that you will have already seen today. But in the meantime, I'll just uh, introduce myself. So I'm Sarah Banning. I am an innovation lead at Innovate UK. And I'm going to be giving you a preview of the enabling research work stream that Nick will have just mentioned very briefly earlier on today. So... Um, Nick will have just mentioned that we have three aspects to the SSPP challenge. The enabling research one being an academic-led program. We have £8 million available for one call. This will be academic-led research to fund research that will address known challenges associated with plastic packaging. So the purpose of this research will be to address those known challenges, as we know there are many at the moment associated with plastic packaging, and we'll be developing solutions that will enable us to really transform the plastic packaging supply chain. So we're looking to fund fundamental research, and we would hope that in doing so, academic partners may either collaborate um, with other academic institutions. However, they also, um, we'd also encourage them to collaborate with members of industry as well, or other third sector organisations. So as I say, we have £8 million available for this. The call will be opening early next year, likely early February. And projects are anticipated to last probably from about 18 months, if, if people are up and ready to go with those, but also they can last up to about 36 months as well. That will take us roughly towards the end of the, um, the SSPP challenge. So we have held a, um, a scoping workshop where we heard some fantastic ideas from the academic community. That happened a few weeks ago now um, in November. And in terms of the, the examples that we've heard, the, the type of research that would, um, would perhaps be relevant for um, this programme include things like living labs. So from a um, kind of a social sciences point of view, can we simulate um, what will perhaps happen through interventions around policy, around regulation, uh, behaviour change, either from the consumer side, but also from business and I guess um, you could think of in terms of if we change business models, how would, what, how would that impact on things like food waste? Um, can we uh, undertake research that enables us to understand what might the implications be on food waste for business models such as reuse and refill? 
So that was just one example that we heard from sort of more of a social sciences point of view. We've had a lot of interest expressed in building our understanding of the environmental impacts of new and existing plastics materials as well. We obviously need to understand more about um, potential new plastics coming on the scene, but also um, fundamental research around this lovely idea of can we really go beyond py pyrolysis? What role could enzymes play in the future in terms of dealing with some of the legacy plastic waste that already exists in the system? So there are opportunities here to deal with kind of the, the, the plastic waste that we currently know about, but equally, how do we move towards a much more smart and sustainable plastic packaging supply chain? Um, research, well, I've mentioned that research could be collaborative, but it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be. Um, we may have um, projects coming through focusing specifically on looking at um, ecotoxicity levels in different environments. I think... Um, given that we are trying to shift an entire system, we're probably going to see quite a few projects where um, they will be multidisciplinary um, and we will be looking for collaboration. However, it's, it's not an absolute essential. I think that's probably enough for now in terms of a preview of um, the enabling research work stream. I will be available as well this afternoon if you've got any questions associated with this. And um, yeah, please feel free to speak to myself or anyone else in the team if you want to know more about that. As I said, it will be opening early next year. We will be holding a similar briefing event for the academic-led call um, in, um, in the new year. So if you're interested in attending that, please let us know and we can make sure that you receive those details of that event. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks.